Okay, today we're going to talk about a brief tutorial on how to use the Vesta software for generating crystal structures. You can find Vesta just by googling Vesta and crystal or crystallography and it's this jp-minerals.org slash Vesta, Vesta website. When you go here, obviously they have a lot of resources that talk about how to use their software and you can check that out in greater detail. For now, we're just going to go to download, download link right here. And from here you can select the one for the right platform that you're using. Go ahead and download it. Okay, once you've done that, the way that we use Vesta is when it opens, it'll look something like this. And right away you could go up here to File and you could go to New Structure. And if you wanted to, you could actually start making your own crystal structure. You'd tell it what unit cell, the structure parameters, you could go on and on, right? But there's a much, much easier way to do that. Um, let's start by taking a look in the literature. So when people write papers, say for example my great colleagues Anton Linux, Stanislav Stoiko, and Arthur Marr at University of Alberta in, in Canada, when they publish something that involves the generation of a new crystal structure, they'll oftentimes report it in its full gory detail in the publication. Right? So for example here, they made a series of compounds going across the rare earth series, going from lanthanum to neodymium, samarium, gadolinium, and then plugging that in here they made all these crystals and they determined their crystal structure. So here you see them reporting it, right? For the lanthanum, for manganese 2, indium, germinate, right? Uh, they report what space group it is. This tells you the symmetry of it. It's number 12 or C2-M. They tell you the lattice parameters A, B, and C, right? If you scroll down to the next page, they tell you for each one of those where each and every atomic position is, right? For the first rare earth position, the second rare earth, for the manganese, the indium, for the two different germanium positions, it tells you the X and the Z. The reason they don't tell you the Y is because Y in this structure happens to be zero for all of them. That's not always the case, right? So if you wanted to, you could actually create your own structure by taking this. What you would do, again, you'd go up here to File, you'd go to New Structure, you'd tell it Unicell. First thing you'd do is you have to pick what system it's in, right? So we know it's number 12. Right, that's in the monoclinic crystal structure. The space group is C2M. Right, so you could start there, and you'd have to type in the lattice parameters. So we're not going to do the full thing. I'll just show you how you would go about this. You type in 16.6, you know, 16.646, 4.41090, and 7.43. Right, you'd put those in right here for your A, B, and C. We're not going to do that. And you need to put the correct angle in as well. Right, their angle is defined as 106.893. So if you wanted to, you could put those in. You would then come over here and you'd start putting in atoms, right? Your first atom is a rare earth, it's lanthanum. So you'd select lanthanum, you could label it however you want. You could call it lanthanum 1, for example. Then you need to actually type in what the x value is and the z value is and what's the occupancy. And again, all that is given in the paper. So if you wanted to, you could go through and you could manually input all this data in and that would give you one compound. Then you'd have to do the same thing for the cerium compound, the same thing for the praseodymium and so forth. Fortunately, once people publish these in journals, there are uh, individuals, sometimes the authors themselves, they will submit them to crystallographic databases or databases will gather this data from journals and create data entries. So we're going to take a look at one of those now. We're going to go to the Crystallography Open Database and here we could search for it a number of ways. For example, we could try and type in the author's name, Olyinik, right? And we could see what comes up. Because they make a lot of crystals, there might be many entries here. Olyinik. It takes just a moment for it to pull up. And yeah, sure enough, uh, Olyanik as the last name, here's our friend Anton, he's done a lot of compounds, so it's going to be a bunch of them here. So instead of doing that, let's go back and search a different way. We're going to go to our search, and instead of doing it by text, let's just do it by elements. We want lanthanum, manganese, germanium, and indium. We want at least four different elements, but we want no more than four different elements. So this will really give us just compounds that have those four things. Wait for it to search. And sure enough, here we go. Lanthanum 4, manganese 2, indium 0.94, germanium. Is that the same thing that we've been looking at? Yeah, it is. That's the same thing that we've been looking at. So with this thing, we can go ahead and double check the space group the same that they reported it is. So we're fine to go ahead and download this CIV file. Now that we've got that CIV file, if you click it and you've already downloaded uh, Vesta, it will go ahead and open it automatically. 
Uh, I think we needed to close the thing that we were working in. It didn't like that we had that open. So let's just close this. Download that one more time. And let's fire it up. And you'll notice that here it is. Here's that crystal structure. However, something that we'd like to teach you how to do in VEST is how to make crystal structures appear in a way that's useful for your audience to interpret them. For example, in the paper that our, uh, these authors wrote, one of the things they did that's really useful is they made a comparison of this structure right here that they synthesized and they compared it to a structure that was already known and they said, look, this motif is similar and the key difference is this sort of repeating sort of star-shaped thing um, is shifting up and down in the y-axis, right? And throughout the paper, they go ahead and they make a series of nice diagrams. The first thing they do is you show you that the, the red atoms, which are their um, germanium atoms, bonded germanium, bonded then to the blue, which are manganese, form this covalent sort of net. So maybe for the first thing we can do is let's go ahead and create those bonds. We're going to tell it to bond germanium to germanium as well as to um, manganese. So let's come over here. To go ahead and find bonds, you can go to edit and then hit bonds. You can also hit control B, right, control B. And it automatically, Vesta does its best to try and guess what bonds will exist in a structure. And for this one, it, it guessed that germanium is bonded to germanium. So let's go ahead and delete that one out, right? If you hit apply, those bonds now disappeared. So let's say we want a new bond. We want, um, I think it was germanium bonded to, what do we want it to? We want the red atoms, which are their germanium. So yeah, we do want germanium to germanium, but we also want germanium to manganese. So germanium to germanium, that's fine. And then we'll do another bond, which is germanium to manganese. Now, that bond, we just punched it in, but it doesn't look like what we're seeing here. We're not seeing these nets forming. So what's happening? What's happening is these bond lengths aren't long enough. So let's go ahead and increase our bond length. Call it like three. If that doesn't change, go ahead and hit four, right? If nothing's happening, let's try this one. Let's bring that one up to four. Okay, there we are. Now we're seeing the same thing that we saw in, in their diagram where if you're looking down the b-axis, right, there's your a-axis and your c-axis, we're looking down the b-axis, which is what they have in this figure, you see this network of covalent bonding. If we wanted to see multiple unit cells, that's easy to do, we come over here to boundary and we can plot as many unit cells as we want. Um, what have they done? Looks like they've done maybe one unit cell up and down the c-direction, so let's do that. Let's go from negative one to, let's go out to positive two in the C direction, right? And there you go. You've got, now Now it becomes clear to see how this network of covalent bonding um, is present in the structure. Again, if they choose to look down the C direction, right, the C axis, let's do that. Let's look down the C axis. You can also see that we've recreated the same structure here. Again, we're missing some of the layers, so if we wanted to, we could add on to our B direction. We could give ourselves two unit cells, for example, and we could see that more clearly. So this is a pretty uh, great tool already, just by using the built-in bond package. But let's look at some of their other figures. If they want to zoom in on individual coordination environments, we can do that. We'll do that in just a moment to look at the different bonds that are extending from each atom. But if you wanted to create this image, how would you go about doing it? Well, what do they have here? They've got their rare earths bonded to their rare earth. That's forming these sort of star-shaped things. But it's not just rare earths because they're also bonded to the occasional manganese. So the first thing we should do is we should modify our thing and get rid of the two bonds we have and replace them with rare earth to rare earth and rare earth to manganese. So we come over here. You can either modify them or just delete them. Let's just delete them. Let's start and we're going to do lanthanum bonded to lanthanum. And now we're going to do another one, which is lanthanum bonded to manganese. Okay. What axis are they looking down? They're looking down the B-axis. And they're, they're looking down the B-axis, but with their C rotated downward. So let's go ahead and do that. You can use these rotate buttons up here. Again, you could translate it. You could rotate it. We're going to rotate it around the, um, the Z-axis, the one that's coming out of the picture, by 45 degrees, 45 degrees again. That makes our C-axis point down. So looking at this, it doesn't look immediately like what we wanted it to. So I practiced this earlier, and I found that if you place, if you change the boundaries, it gives you a better starting point. So let's uh, modify our boundaries. Oh, it looks like we have to change one of our bonds too. One of the bonds isn't showing up. 
That's right, we'll change that in a moment. The boundaries that we should use are negative um, 0 0.15 to 1.3 in the x. We should go from 0 to 1 in the y, and we should go from negative uh, 0 0.5 to positive 1.4 in the c. So hit apply. Now again, to create the, sta the star-shaped structures they have, they have the square, and then on each side of the square they have these little triangles. Right? We have the square, but we're missing one of our triangles. So one of our bond lengths between this rare earth and that rare earth must not be quite long enough. So that's, let's increase the length of our lanthanum lanthanum to say 4.5. Okay, now they're there. Right? See the square with the triangles around each side. But this is much busier than theirs. There's, there's a problem, right? Theirs, they have this nice gap where there's no bonds there. Now, that distance between this and that is less than this and that, but they're not showing it on purpose because it makes it easier to visualize. Well, we can do the same thing. We can go ahead and delete that bond out. So the first thing we should do is let's delete out things that we, um, that we don't need here. So you can rotate this freely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to fix it along the b-axis and I'm going to manually I'm turning this thing counterclockwise. By turning it counterclockwise, it slowly is going to make that a flat surface on the top. See how this unit cell is now flat, it's horizontal? That allows me to click the now select tool. This was the rotate tool from before. We can now click the select tool. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete out some of these atoms that we don't need. So I've selected those, and deleting them is as simple as hitting delete. Same with the bottom. Here's the bottom of that star, bottom of that star, bottom of that star. So these atoms we don't need. Right. Um, and that's fine for now. Let's uh, rotate it back to how it was. So again, I'm going to rotate clockwise this time. That'll slowly bring this C pointing down and look down the B-axis. And that's about where we were. Okay, looking right down the B-axis, best as we're able. Okay, again, if you wanted to, we could try and delete out more things we know that we're need, not going to need. Uh, for example, all of these we won't need. We won't need those. We don't need... Um, those, don't need that, don't need that, don't need these two, or this one. See how it's slowly starting to take shape, it's starting to slowly look more like the one in their diagram by deleting out some of these extras. Okay, now let's delete out the ones in the middle, right? Again, they have these star shapes. Um, connected here but disconnected there because they want to show a difference between these these different motifs. So let's go ahead and delete those out. We're going to delete these bonds along there. Um, there. Okay. If this is hard to see, you can zoom in. Up here you've got your zoom functions. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit, make this easier for me to see. Um, we want that gone, that gone, we want that, oops, you can undo. I didn't want to get rid of that whole atom, just the bond. Like that, like that, and like that. So now you can see these things are starting to look more like the one in the drawing. So again, over here, we want this one gone. We want that one gone. Get rid of these. Okay. And now, this almost looks like the one in their drawing. Let's transit this upward a little bit and zoom out one. It almost looks like the one in their drawing. It's looking quite close, right, here. The only thing is they've now highlighted theirs differently to show that it's a layer below. So if we wanted to, we could actually export this image right now to something like Illustrator or Photoshop and do that work. But something that's an easy way to, to do the same thing to show it is you can hold down the Shift button and... Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to get rid of all this. But I'm going to hold the shift button, and I'm going to highlight as many of them as I can in the middle section. That gives them this sort of yellow marking on the edges, which sets them apart. Now you can just grab the ones that you weren't able to get. Again, make sure that these bonds are all selected. Um, grab these. Select those bonds. Grab that. Bond with it. And just like that, now you can see that this is starting to look pretty similar to what they've created here. And you could go on. For example, we could change the colors of these things. Their rare earths are purple, whereas our rare earth is green. So that's all. That can all be changed really easily. Um, you would just come over here to um, Properties. 
and under properties, under individual atoms, you could change their color from the default, right? Lanthanum's default color is this um, RGB value of 91, 96, 73, or this green color. But you can make it anything you want. If you want it to be hot pink, you could go ahead and do so, right? Notice it changes the bond colors automatically based off of what the atom color is, right? So we didn't save that, so it didn't keep it, but that would be one possibility. Um, another thing you can do is you can use, uh, right now we're using ball and stick style to show this, but you could also show things in polyhedra. Um, polyhedra is a great tool for, uh, for showing things that are like perovskites. Let's pull up an example of that. If we go to um, our class that we taught, pull up our Vesta structures, let's take a look at our perovskite. Okay, and the perovskite, let's zoom out a little bit. Right now, it's showing bonds from the A site to the oxygen, as well as the B site in blue to the oxygen. First thing we do is let's get rid of the A site to the oxygen. That's not normally shown, shown when you talk about the crystal structure of perovskite. So now we're just showing bonds between the B atom and the oxygens. If you wanted to show polyhedra, you just click polyhedra. Again, this makes it useful to see a, uh, the sort of motif that happens in this crystal structure. Showing many unit cells, you can see Oh, so that's how these atoms are arranged. It makes it a little bit easier to see where the open spaces might be in a crystal structure. Other things you can do with, with Vesta, which is really powerful, is you can put planes in. So let's go back to our ball and stick model for a moment. Let's say we want to introduce a crystallographic plane. So you come up here to edit. We're going to go to lattice planes, and we're going to do a new lattice plane. And let's say we wanted to show, I don't know, the 111 plane. So now there's the 11 plane on here. And by default, they do distance from origin, um, not always what you're looking for. So you could do the distance from origin just at zero. You could center it at the origin if you wanted. Uh, now you don't see it because our boundaries are set to go from zero to positive three, but if we went from say, negative one to positive one on all of these, we will see it. Again, we told that plane to cut through the origin, right? The origin is that back left corner, right? Centered around that atom, that's the origin. So the 111 plane is slicing right through that, okay? You could move it wherever you want it though. You, if you wanted to place it somewhere else, um, you could do so really easily. Basically the way that it does it, it places it some distance from the origin in terms of angstroms. So you could do, you could do anything you want. If you wanted to do multiple planes, you could do that too. If you want to show the 111 as well as the 100, um, you could do that. Right? So that's the 101, 100. Um, there it goes. Now you've got both those planes. You can see where they intersect one another in this crystal structure. Right? And then the last thing I want to show you how to do up here is um, under vectors. Just like you can show planes, you can show individual vectors, right? Positions of, let's say, like if you want to show a direction, right? So again, let's start with something located on the strontium-1 atom, which is the one located at the origin, 0, 0, 0. We're going to create a new vector. This vector, let's say we want it to point in the 1, 1, 1 direction, okay? In the 1, 1, 1 direction, you can tell it how long you want it to go and, and all that. You can give it a color. This is all uh, something that you can adjust. And now when you look at this, our atom, um, let's see, let me go back to that. Vectors. Oh, sorry, I forgot to set it. Okay, there we go. I set it on every single strontium atom I placed that. And right now it's too large, so if you wanted to, we could always make that shorter. So we can edit that bond and make it a little bit shorter, maybe smaller radii. If it's too large, you can make that a 0.2. Okay, you'll see that get smaller in terms of radius. You can also change the length. <clears throat> um, you can change the length by, is, is that the modulus value? Oh yeah, the modulus value changes the length, right? So this is a nice way to show different crystallographic directions in your unit cell. This is really useful for showing, say, magnetic moments. If certain atoms are spin up or spin down, this is a really useful way to show them. So this is a primer and an introduction to Vesta. Vesta can do a lot more stuff. For example, it can generate powder diffraction patterns for things, which is pretty awesome. Um, it can generate, you know, for this structure, it can tell you exactly where you expect to see X-ray diffraction patterns, which is pretty terrific. And it can do a lot of other really useful things, um, and we hope that you'll be able to use it going forward.